Let's go in our Bibles. We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 this morning. Today we, uh, we come to a close of this letter that Paul has written to the church at Corinth. If you do not have a worship guide, there are some on the back table. Our ushers would be glad to just raise your hand, a place for you to put down the notes there. They'll bring them to you. Just put your hand up. I uh, want you to be able to have that uh, to put notes down from this closing message. The title of the message today is You Are Loved. You Are Loved. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 19 to 24. Maybe you know this already, but the love of Christ is life-changing. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't leave any stone unturned. That's a testimony right there. The love of Christ. The gospel brings about a supernatural transformation, and it happens from the inside out. It's not a change from the outside in. It's a change from the inside out. And Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's why we open our Bibles to learn. And our learning is for living. The gospel is proclaimed so that it can be heard and that faith might be given to the hearers. This entire work of saving sinners, beloved, it's all of God's grace. It's all about grace. Now, no doubt this morning, the Apostle Paul, if he could have been here, he is a, would be a much better preacher, okay? But let me tell you this with all confidence. He didn't have a better gospel to preach. Better preacher? I'll concede that any day. But he doesn't have a better message. The message is the gospel. So no matter who you are, where you go this week, you may say, well, somebody else could say it better than I could. That, that's true. That can be said of all of us. But what is said, what is communicated, the gospel, there is no better message than the gospel. Amen? Amen. And we can all take this gospel like seed and scatter it wherever we go. This is life changing. Paul traveled to Corinth. He preached the good news. And people came to faith in Christ. They were changed. They turned from their sin and they trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. They left behind idolatry and they became worshipers of Jesus. And Jesus saved them and he changed them. He bought them with his blood. He placed them into his kingdom. They were taken from spiritual darkness into his marvelous light. But that didn't make everything easy for them. That didn't mean that they didn't have struggles with temptation, that they didn't have marital problems, that they didn't still deal with jealousy, that they still didn't have problems with racism and ethnic and social divisions. Just because they were born again didn't mean they never dealt with covetousness or bitterness again. But Paul wrote to them and he called them saints, holy ones. Because they were in Christ. Their conduct daily, their thinking needed to be reconciled to the reality of who they were in Christ. And for some of us this morning, that same reconciliation needs to happen in our lives. Have you ever read a good book? Or maybe you've watched a, a really good movie. Or maybe you went to an art gallery and you walk through the art gallery, you watch the movie, you read the book, and you got to the end and, and it resolved. Or you learned something about the artist, the painter. Or you read and the, the book ended and then it unfolded and you look back across the book and you're like, wait a second. I want to watch this again. I need to read this again. Hang on a second. I need to walk back through this gallery because I didn't realize the painter painted it with their mouth. Now I have to look at it through a different perspective. Johnny Erickson Tata is a painter. She's the lady that dove into a pool or a lake when she was a teenager and she snapped her spinal cord. She paints drawings, Google it, with her mouth. That changes how you look at the picture. Like, I can't draw that with my hands. And she drew that with her mouth? 
when Paul closes this letter, he's aiming at the heart. It's the only way anyone changes. He wants to close this letter in such a way that the Corinthians say, okay, we heard the letter. Now go back to page one. We need to do this again. And this time we, we've heard the whole message now. We've read the whole letter. Now let's go back and let's cut this apart so that we can put it into practice in our lives. We need to listen with, with tenderized ears. Our heart has now been tenderized. We've been reminded of his love for us and God's love for us. We are loved, so let's read it again. Let's go back and you're like, is pastor prepping us? We're going to go back through Corinthians? No, but you can find them all online. They're all online. All right, there you go. Okay, so we're not going back through it. Some of you are like, whoo. But that's what Paul intends for the Corinthians. You have the letter. You have the word of God. It's in your possession. Now, with your heart in unison, with mind, God willing, he's going to do everything he can to equip them to have tenderized hearts. But the response rests with the Corinthians. The response for obedience rests with you this morning. I can do everything, and God knows my heart. I have. I've prepared. I love you. I want to communicate this message in love, but I can't act for you. When I ask you at the end, so what's your next step? I can't step there for you. You have to take that step. Some of you, it has to humble you to take that step of obedience. And that's where God would have you. That's where he wants you. You have to leave behind pride. You have to leave behind whatever it may be to step forward in obedience. That's what Paul is doing as this letter comes to a close. Our study has been devoted not just to information. I don't care if you know a whole lot about Corinthians now. My heart's concern is that what are we doing with what we know? We've had people start this study with us. They aren't in fellowship with us now. The message is needed. We're not listened to. That breaks my heart as a pastor. It ought to break our hearts as a congregation to say, what are we doing when we hear the word of God, but we think it's just information instead of this is for application. This is to do something, not just know something. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, James writes. So that's my aim this morning, is that we understand what is it that God would have us to do according to his word, not invented and not imposed on his word. What is it that God would have me to do? And by your grace and by your strength and by your spirit, Lord, help me to do it. Help me to obey. Let's go in our Bibles, 1 Corinthians 16. These closing remarks from Paul, he's, he writes to this, this church in Corinth. He says, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another, here it is, with a holy kiss. The salutation with my own hand, Paul's. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. It ends. This is the word of the Lord. Paul has finished this first letter. He's done everything under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he can possibly do in this letter to position the Corinthians to know what they need to know and to do what they need to do. But understand this, beloved. He is not after them going through the motions. He's not after perfunctory worship. He's not after autopilot. I come in, I know the songs, I just sing, I give, I listen, I go, another week. No, 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 no. He's aiming for transformation, a radical change in their lives. And it all comes down to authenticity from the heart. He's all about the heart. And that's Old Testament and New Testament. These laws in the Old Testament are to be written on the heart. It's not just going through the motions. He could have said what he wrote to the Ephesians. 
He's asking them to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. This is the heart. This is the desire of every good and godly pastor, a shepherd, an under-shepherd, an elder. This is the desire for God's people. So the question that we're going to answer this morning with four truths and four responses, how do we respond to the four truths, these powerful truths from the apostle's conclusion to his letter? He's closing out. He's going to give to us four truths. But again, listen to me closely. This is not a lecture. This is not a talk for you to have more data when you leave. That's not why Paul wrote to them. It's for life change. Radical life change. So the first truth we see in verses 19 and 20 is this. Because of Christ's love, you are not alone. Okay, so he's writing to the Corinthians and he's greeting them. He's sending them greetings and they need to be reminded you're not alone. Because of Christ's love, there is the the chief mover in our salvation, in our sanctification, in everything that is good in life. It's Jesus. Amen? It's all about Jesus. So because of Christ's love, Corinthians, listen to me, you are never, ever alone. That's good news. Okay, so this should lift their hearts. This should encourage them. And then... Like I said, it's not just a, okay, I know something now. No, no, no. This is for a point. Here's the point. Receive this love. This is what needs to be done in light of that. Receive this love. That's what Paul wants for the Corinthians. I want you to take this in. I want you to hear what I'm writing to you, and I want you to receive it. Some of you are good givers, but you're not good receivers. When someone gives to you, 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 it just, uh, I should be the one giving It takes both. Somebody to receive means somebody gives, and somebody gives to receive. You have to have both, or it's just throwing it on the ground. That's one thing that goes into our giving of gifts. It's not just to cross off names on a list. It shouldn't be. It's that we love someone, and we listen, and we care about them, and the gift is just a little bit of sharing our heart with them. It's just just a token, a demonstration of, I love you. I care about you. I'm thankful for you. Here's a gift. It's just a token of my respect and appreciation and love for you. There's a time to give. There's a time to receive. And Paul writes, the churches of Asia greet you. That's the first group. There's four different groups. Corinthians, you're not alone. There's other people who are concerned about your conduct, concerned about your discipleship, concerned about your well-being. So he, he, they send you their greetings, all right? Much more than a cold handshake. Much more than a formality. Much more than a passing, hey. Oh, they, if they could be there, they would be hugging you. They would be embracing you. Maybe you got that family member, you know? Brothers don't shake hands, they hug. Ah. You're like, ah. Okay, they are greeting you warmly. They love you, and they're sending their embrace through this letter. So Paul says these churches in Asia. Paul's writing from the Roman province of Asia. Ephesus was the capital. It occupied the western portion of modern Turkey. This would have included Ephesus, Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis. There were other churches that were concerned about what's happening in Corinth. They cared about them across the Aegean Sea. Oh, it's good. It's healthy for churches to be partnered together, connected together. It's a great help to pastors, to under shepherds, to elders, along with great camaraderie between congregations. There's churches that have been a blessing. I've been going over 10 years down to Cleveland, Ohio, Alistair Begg's ministry, Parkside Conference. That ministry is invested into me. Those men are like brothers to me and they care. They care about what's happening in this congregation. Traverse City, the Harvest Bible Chapel, they they care what's going on in this congregation. There's people that I've been in ministry with, they care about what's happening, and they ask, hey, how, how are things going? And it's not just going through the motions asking, they care. They love me, they love you. 
our health, our vibrancy and the work of the Lord is within a larger work of our mission partnerships. Irfan flies out tomorrow. We have to be praying for him. That tooth is hurting him. He needs a root canal. He doesn't have time to do it. He may have to have that thing overseas. God bless Irfan. Okay, we got to be praying for him. But you can, can you see on the giving? Can you see what came in? Right over here, this little note. College and career. And other people. And, and $1,658 sent out to say, hey, we love you, Irfan. We are wanting this church to be planted in Cairo, Egypt. And we are wanting to bless you. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. And I know more was given in other ways, even to that ministry on, on Giving Tuesday and at other times. We care about them. They care about us. Tuesday night's meeting of this past week, gathering with our children's ministry workers, that team. What a great team. We're preparing for 2019 and the two services taking those devoted individuals who are willing, hearts united to say, here we are for the glory of God. There's a concern. Paul says, you're not alone. Then he introduces us to Aquila and Priscilla. Sometimes it's, a, it's written Prisca in your Bibles. And he says, they greet you heartily or warmly in the Lord. This husband-wife team might be an MVP husband-wife team in the New Testament. Aquila and Priscilla. This is a couple like we studied last week. They were addicted to serving the saints. Devoted to serving the saints. Everywhere they went, and they traveled a lot, everywhere they went, they did the same things. They loved the Lord, and they loved people, and they opened wide their hearts, their homes, to say, we're here for you, Lord. And they were a blessing Everywhere we see him in the New Testament. A little background on this. Mr. Aquila, all right, his name means eagle. That's the emblem of the Roman army. And uh, Prisca's name means primitive or worthy or venerable of, a, of an old time. She may have belonged to a distinct, distinguished Roman family. They were both Jews from Pontus. And around 8, 80, 49, the emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews. That means they had to move out. They had to leave. They had to go. This would have been a severe trial. You ever lost your home? You ever had to move and you didn't want to move? How do we respond to those times? Those are not easy. Aquila and Priscilla understand what it is to have to flee, and that wasn't on their to-do list. How do they respond in this great trial? There's no mention of them having children. There's an opportunity for heartache. But in turn, that just turned around for great and effective ministry to churches wherever they traveled. In the church, in the body, life of a church. Let me tell you something. Those who don't have children, those who their children are grown and gone, gone out of the house, empty nesters. Do you understand how valuable you are in the church? You're like, woohoo, my kids are, they're moved out now. Guess what? There's other people that need your hands in the work and ministering and caring for their kids. Monica, I appreciate your ministry to Pastor Jamie's family. Just like, hey, that, that's it. And others, it's always dangerous when you start mentioning a name and I don't do it for flattery. But there's reality of ministry in this church family that resembles this. And I want to encourage that. I want to build that up. Those of you without children, there's a ministry for you. There's an opportunity for you to come along someone who's like, oh, these kids, and say, let me help you. All right, dear Lord, you got to help me. It's been a while. Uh, I can do this with your help. It's so important. They were tent makers. So they could find work. That was a important, you know, construction. Wherever they, somebody needs tents. Wherever they went, that's what Paul was. That's how they probably connected when they met, that's what their trade was. They served the Lord together, this team. That's not always easy as husbands and wives. Serving the Lord. Conflict, a lot of conflict can happen at sermon preparation time, lesson preparation time. 
on the way out of the door. Anybody have a great, glorious morning? Family just walked out like, good morning, wife. Good morning, husband. Let's go worship the Lord today. Come on, children. Oh, yes, mom. That's yeah, Isn't this glorious? Oh, they buckled themselves. They fed themselves breakfast. And the pets are all just taken care of. I don't know if that happens in any home. Not our house. <laughs> That's why I leave early and separately so that when I get here, I'm, I'm able to be focused. And Ginger's like, you, don't, you, t- you have one person to get ready. Well, they're old enough now. They can, they can help. But she's embraced that. She has borne that for all of the years we've had children, 18 now, almost 19, and set me apart. And this is a teamwork where she allows me to come to be of sound mind as best as possible. And that's way too much laughing right there. But sound mind so that I'm actually worth something in this hour trying to deliver the word of God. A quiet blessing. Go with me to Acts chapter 18. This is where we meet this team. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, went to Corinth, and he found. Do you know anybody that's always trying to find somebody? They're thankful they've been found by the Lord, and they're always trying to find someone. My grandparents were those kind of people. They were always looking. My grandfather, Bender, he made a promise to the Lord as a farmer, farmer in Nebraska. Anybody that comes on this property, Lord, I'll share the gospel with them. And he kept that word. He kept that word. He loved to share the gospel. He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to, be depart, to depart from Rome. All right, just kind of picture a Hitler there, okay? hated Jewish people, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked by, for by occupation. They were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. This is where we're introduced to this couple. Later on in this chapter, they traveled to Ephesus with Paul. Look down at verse 18. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren, sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Interesting. Priscilla's name comes first. That's unusual in the Bible, that her name comes before his. Paul had his hair cut off in Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue. He sailed on. Look at verse 24. We meet uh, this Jew named Apollos born of Alexandria, an eloquent man uh, and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately concerning the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through, the, through, the grace, through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Oh, they encouraged Apollos. They knew how to do it in a right way. They're like, hey, he has part one of the message, but he hasn't heard part two. He's still saying Messiah will come. We need to tell him. He came, he lived the life we could never live, he died the death we deserved to die, and he rose from the dead, he ascended, and he's coming back, and we'll honor this man, and we'll do it in a right way. Hey, Apollos, would you come with us? We want to talk to you. And they encouraged him, and he then moves on, and they have a part in that ministry. They have a share in the ministry of Apollos as he goes on and God used him powerfully. We see him in 2 Timothy 4.19 when they're back in Ephesus again and Paul writes and he's in his closing, uh, his closing days of his life and he writes and here this couple is that meant so much to him throughout the years and what are they doing? 
about the year AD 66, 2 Timothy 4.19, and Paul says, greet Prisca and Aquila. They're still serving the Lord. They're still doing the same things they've done everywhere they've gone and everywhere they've traveled. Can we all say, God help me to be like them? That's a good pattern to follow. Church history and tradition records that eventually Priscilla and Aquila were marched outside of the city and beheaded. When Paul thinks of them in Romans 16 and he mentions them, he calls them this. He says, they're my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. And he notes this about them, that they risk their own necks for my life. Do you know anybody that would risk their own neck for your life? Can I just say this as a pastor? The people who for the glory of Christ and his church risk their own necks for my life, do you understand how valuable you are? Do you understand how much encouragement comes and settling on the word of God happens when people say, we have your back for the glory of God? That is Priscilla and Aquila. And Paul didn't forget it. And it missed. So we know about the apostle Paul, but understand how valuable the people behind the scenes are for him to be used by God in the way that he was. And he says, they risked their necks for me. They laid it all in line. That may have had to do with something that happened in Ephesus where they imposed themselves. Paul, you stay here. Uh, We don't know what happened, but Paul did, and he never forgot it. He never forgot. They stood with me. They put their, they interposed their own lives for mine. Oh, hallelujah. And And you know what? We're going to meet them one day. Oh, we'll meet Paul. But where's this couple? Aquila's name comes before, or or Priscilla's name comes before Aquila's a lot of times when it's mentioned in the Bible. That's That's normally not the way it is. This woman may have been like some of you ladies. Your understanding of the Bible is just phenomenal. Maybe she's trained. Maybe she's just super wise and smart and Aquila just loves his wife and he's learning. But they're the team. We come to home Bible fellowships, adult small groups, and husband and wife teams are going to minister together, serving and caring for the congregation in this way. Paul says there's another group. There's a church that met in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. In Ephesus, there were people under their care who were concerned equally about the church in Corinth. They never met them, but they met Aquila and Priscilla. And like, hey, if you care about them, hey, we're the church in your house. We care about them too. Hey, Paul, tell them we greet them. Tell them we're concerned about them. They were devoted to serving the saints. There's a graphic that'll come up on the screen of one artist's rendering of what an uh, early synagogue would look like in the meeting area. And you know when I, I look at this picture, I think like, I've seen that house. It's all over India. Isaac Shaw finds houses like that and they buy them. And they put a pastor and they put a missionary in there. And the missionary goes out into all the province and he comes back and he stays there from time to time. And then they meet there and they do stitching classes there and they do computer training there. I'm like, I've seen that house. Uh, Stephen in teaching this morning showed us a picture that Irfan posted of the the apartment in Cairo, Egypt. They're set up. It's just just humble. And they're going to cram people in there. They're going to... Rejoice in the gospel and you're going to depend on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, you hang around, you walk together with someone long enough and you're going to get to know what they love and cared about. Aquila and Priscilla, they open wide their their hearts, their house. There are people in this congregation, you do that regularly and you view your house as the Lord's and you just open your home and you say, come on in and share a meal and come on into this space and you know, me casa, you casa. I don't know if I said that right, but my house, your house. I didn't, I, I destroyed it, okay? 
Sukasa, is that better? I don't know. All right, so that's, that's Priscilla and Aquila. They were wide open. They weren't like, this is ours, stay away, all mine. They were like, it's all God's. So wherever we go, come on in. And let's rejoice in the gospel together. Hey, this is a good reminder for us to evaluate what, are, what do you prioritize? What do you talk about when you're with other people? Who is it that you spend time with? What do you talk about? If you're influencing them, and you are, and they're influencing you, and they are, um, that's going back and forth. What is it that they carry? Because the church in the house is like, hey, hey, can you put us in there? Uh, we are praying for them too. We were praying for them the last time we met. We care about what's happening in Corinth. We love Priscilla and we love Aquila. And when they would have heard that in Corinth, they would have said, we love Priscilla and Aquila. We're thankful for them. They've had a key role in the founding of this church. And there's a church in their house. Hey, we're not alone. We're loved. We're loved. We're loved. Paul influenced them and they influenced others. I praise the Lord for you who are just selfless. And you say, here's my house. Use it. Use it for the glory of God. This was, a, this was an all-star team. This was a great marriage. Did I say it was a marriage without conflict? I didn't say that. I don't know. I pretty much know that there's not a marriage without conflict. The question is not do you have conflict. The question is how do you work through that conflict? Or do you just sweep it under the rug and go on, husbands and wives, and then come in here and fake it, and your children watch that? That's not Priscilla and Aquila. That's not, that's not right. Let's get honest. There's brokenness in all of us. God has sustained our lives, our marriage, all against us over years and background and everything. God has sustained us. But what does it demand and absolutely require? There's no way around authenticity. That what you are at home, on the way in the car, and here, your kids are seeing the same person. And there's times, and this week for me was another one, of having to go into one of the kids' rooms and say, hey, Dad blew it. I don't like to have, to have those conversations. But I have a wife that helps me in that. If I will listen and I will humble myself and say, hey, I was missing it. Can we keep this couple in mind? I praise God for the victories that we have in marriage and the victories that we have in the families of this church. But when you step forward to serve the Lord, There's an enemy, and he wants you to hang back, do nothing, and just exist, live, and die. But there's more to life than that. There's a fourth group. He says, all the brethren. Well, who's this group? I don't know. All the believers in Ephesus in on this? Like, tell them we all care about them. We love them. Tell them to listen to you. We greet you. We greet them. Write it down. Paul wrote it down. They greet you. This makes me think about the brothers that I met when I was in India, the brothers that I met when I was in Africa. And when they message me on Facebook or whatever, they're always like, you know, when are you coming back? I miss them. They care about this church. I care about those churches there. There's a, there's a close knit. Listen, just think about this. You are going to meet one day in the presence of the Lamb of God, the people that your $5, $50, $500, $5,000, $50,000 that you may invest, whatever it may be that you could do, and you're going to meet them one day around the, the throne of the Lamb of God. And that's when we'll look at our investments and say, wow, so glad I made that decision. Number two, you've been loved by Christ to love one another. Okay, Paul isn't just putting these, these four groups who are all united together. He's not just mentioning them for nothing. In verse 20, he, at the end of that verse, he says, so here's what I want you to do. Hey, Corinthians, you're not getting along so well? I want you to get up 
and greet one another with a holy kiss. I thought about trying to work this one out in a sermon. I'm like, man, this could be really weird. Middle of the sermon, like, yeah, now. But Paul is saying, hey, you are loved. You have been loved. So this love isn't for you to hoard. This love is to flow through you. This love is not to be a pond stored up out back that begins to die and stink. This is a river flowing through you to the ends of the earth for the glory of God. This is what Paul is saying. You have been loved by Christ to love one another. So here's your response. Share this love. Give it away. It's free. It was given to you freely. So share this love. He gives a direct exhortation, a command for them. He wants them to respond to this love by expressing it genuinely and wholeheartedly to those immediately around them. As I said, when I was a kid, I was, I was always waiting, you know, not a little kid. A little kid would be like, gross. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Are you kidding me? Yeah. This is a holy kiss. This is a, I love you in the Lord. I love you in the Lord. This is looking people in their eyes. This is walking together and knowing one another and loving people when they're difficult and loving people when they push back and loving people when it's hard and loving people when it's good. This is loving people to the end. And, and not everybody's easy to love to the end. And Paul says, you greet one another. You greet one another with a holy kiss. And listen, don't leave somebody out. When you come in this place, don't look around and say, here's my seat and I'm all by myself and I sit by myself. Hey, church family. Who needs to be greeted in the love of the Lord? You have a mission. And every week when you come in this place, you say, God, I'm here. I want to be a blessing. Show me who I'm going to be a blessing to today. And you have a never-ending ministry. Greet one another with a holy kiss. We are to respond to this overwhelming love of God by expressing it genuinely to those immediately around us. This implies that we are actually getting to know one another, that we're getting to know each other's names, that we actually care about one another, and we serve one another relentlessly. 1 John 4, 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If we love one another well, that word will go out. Oh, because sometimes it's easier to love the stranger than it is to love the people that are closest to you. But we have been loved by Christ to love one another and to share this love. Number three, here comes a more stern note. Not everyone shares in Christ's love. Not everyone shares in Christ's love. Paul says this salutation with my own hand Paul's. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Not everyone shares in this love. So the response is this, church. Beware of adversaries to this love. You got to watch out. Beware. Here's a newsflash. Not everyone loves the church of Jesus Christ like Jesus. So Paul, in this note, in this closing, I love you, but I still have something difficult to say. So he takes the pen from his amanuensis, his scribe, and he says, I need to write this. Give me the pen. I need to say this. It's a closing signature of authenticity. Paul's custom was to do this. Take the pen. Close out the letter. And I was thinking about it. I was thinking, what, what might this look like? When you get to this section and you've got all this nice writing all the way, and then all of a sudden you get to Paul's writing, the apostles. What does it look like? And I thought of, you know what? I've seen this writing before. It's my grandfather's. My grandfather's writing, and the next screen is going to pull up a picture from a long time ago. That's my grandfather, out in Montana, out in the Bob Marshall wilderness. 
And on this, when he passed away, we were looking through. This is taken off a, a legal pad. And, I, and I'm looking at his writing. I, I wish I had a letter from college. I can't find them. It's his writing. It's a little bit hard to read. Psalm 1. The blessed man. Here he has a cross reference as he's preparing to do something. I don't know when this was or what he was teaching. I've got his magnifying glass in my bag right here. Toward the end of his life, he had his Bible broken into three. It was three books that would stack this high for him to see it until he couldn't read that anymore. And here he writes, the blessed man. And then he has this Romans 4, 8 under the blessed man. And this is Romans 4, 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That's not a picture of a perfect man. That's a picture of a sinner redeemed by grace. And when he's thinking about the gospel, and when he's thinking about the goodness of the Lord, and he thinks about it's not imputed sin. It, doesn't mean, it means it not charged against your account. Blessed is the man. His resolution, and he goes back to Psalm 1, stands not, walks not. Sits not. And here he is, late in life, and he's writing. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, wherever that went off the table or something. His meditation, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, it's gone. I don't know where it went or where that paper is. And then breaks into a, a writing of the vagabond, and he has all these stories. But something caught my attention this morning, and I looked at this. I hadn't looked at this before. I'm like, what is this? Sunshine and glory. There will be singing over the river faces I see. And I'm like, huh. I don't know what this is. Okay, there's a thing called Google. Listen to this. The writer of this is from Downriver, Michigan. Judson Wheeler Van D. Venter. Probably said that bad. This is what he says. Looking this way is the title. Listen, listen to this, what he had his mind on. Over the river, faces I see, fair as the morning, looking for me, free from their sorrow. Grief. and despair, waiting and watching patiently there. Looking this way, yes, looking this way. Loved ones are waiting, looking this way. Fair as the morning, bright as the day. Dear ones in glory, looking this way. And then the writer goes on and he lists all of these people. Father and mother on the other side, they're in heaven. Brother and sister, gone to that climb. And then he looks at this one, sweet little darling. Listen, my, my grandfather and my grandmother, they knew what it was to deliver babies. And they didn't live. And whenever my grandfather would think about what they went through and the sorrow. He just, maybe I got all my emotion from him, I don't know. But he had a special place for little ones. And it drove him crazy at the end of his life that he couldn't hear what they were saying. He couldn't really see them. Sweet little darling, light of the home. Looking for someone, beckoning, come. Bright as a sunbeam. P 
pure as pure as the two. I'm about to have to use this to read it to make this font bigger. Anxiously looking, mother for you. And I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about all of my grandparents in heaven. I'm thinking about the sorrow that sometimes it comes more intensely in this season. And I'm thinking, you know what? There's wisdom that can be gained from the man, the simple, no graduate from Bible college. He took classes from Moody. He served at the Pacific Garden Mission and he made a lot of mistakes and I've made a lot of mistakes and my dad has made a lot of mistakes and you've probably made a a lot of mistakes. But this was a man who did love the Lord. And those shoes are really small. He was like this tall. I, but those are really hard for me to fill. Because wherever he went, he built churches and he cared about people. And he's looking this way. Heaven is concerned about what we're doing here this morning. And the greatest concern is what's happened with your sin. Has your sin been covered by the love, mercy, grace, the blood of Christ? Or are you still in your own sin? Have you looked to Jesus? Paul, he thinks about this church he takes up the pen for himself. He writes and he gives a curse on the troublemakers there. He loved the church in Corinth. Therefore, he hated the actions of those who were there in the church and they were causing problems. They were uprooting the church. Listen, every church has problems. You can't go find a church and, well, this one doesn't have any problems where there are no people in it. Every church has problems. What is Paul talking about? He's not talking about the unbelievers in Corinth. The wrath of God was abiding on them and he went to Corinth and he preached the gospel to them. He's talking and he's writing to the people that are there in the Corinthian church who need to humble themselves. He's addressing anyone in Corinth who persisted in unloving division, unrepentant immorality, rejection of the gospel, and they refused to forgive their brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul put, simply put here, those who continue in sin and rebellion, they demonstrate a serious problem in their love for Jesus Christ, their affection for Christ. This is a wake-up call that he's writing, and he writes it in his own hand. He wants it said exactly the way he intends to say it. That if a member loves him or herself more than Jesus, they will cause great harm to the church. So Paul is stating that if anybody doesn't have affection for the Lord, then this lack of love would breed all types of problems for the church. But if members love Jesus, and if members love the gospel, if members have the mind of Christ, then they will grow, and they will grow, and they will grow in their relentless love for one another. They will not give up on one another. They will bear long. They will forbear. They will love. And the world will look in and say, what is this? This is love. This is the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Like that above, those looking this way. The angels care about what we do. They watch our worship. They care of how we regard the Son of God. This is the church, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So Paul, oh get this beloved, he put a curse on troublemakers in the church. I 
anathema. He's trying to wake them up to the reality of the grave danger they were in. Paul knew what it was to be against Christ. Acts 9.4, Jesus said to him, Saul of Tarsus, he's on the way to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I take what you're doing personally. Think about that. Paul used this strong language in Corinthians. He used it to the Galatians. Galatians 1, the verses 6 through 10, that if anyone comes preaching another gospel, there isn't another gospel. But if they come, either we, an angel, they come and they teach another gospel, let him be anathema, eternally damned, a curse, because there's not another gospel that saves. And if you give somebody, do these things and don't do these things and pray these times, and that doesn't save them, then you're closing their eyes in religion and double damning them. This is strong language. Now, let's be honest. There's nobody in the Corinthian church that's going to say, hey, that's me. I don't love Jesus. It's not going to be that easy to figure out, beloved. They didn't get the sticker at the Welcome Center. Don't love Jesus. That's me. But make no mistake. The head of the church, the Lord Jesus himself, knows who loves him and who does not love him. He knows. So Paul pronounces this curse, and it would be in this, who is unloving in their actions in the life of the church? Repentance and restoration was in order, and then he moves from this curse to a cry out for Jesus to come. Maranatha. Maranatha. An Aramaic. He cries out, even come, Lord Jesus. So come, Lord Jesus. Come. It's your church. You defend your church. Why does he need to do this? Oh, he has compassion. This can be interpreted the Lord has come. Well, he did. He came the first time and he will come again. But most likely, Paul is calling on the Lord Jesus to come. Defend your church by punishing her internal adversaries. And from this, Paul moves to a call for grace, a prayer. The fact is, is that there's still remaining sin in all of our lives. As Paul writes this, Lord, you come and defend your church. There would have been areas in Paul's life, according to Romans 7, that he was not yet fully obedient in every way and every thought and every action. So we all need grace. There's a desperate need for all sinners to experience this grace and to receive mercy. We're all saved by grace. We stand, we live in grace. We are, we say it this way, a graced people bringing the gospel of grace to all peoples. It's what we've received and it's what we give away. It's our name, it's grace. You could slap that on a church. But if we're not demonstrating this in our lives, it's a conundrum. That's our name. Grace is our song. Grace is our life. Grace defines our mission. So let me ask us this morning, do you look inside here? Do you look around? Do you see ways that we're growing in grace together? Do you see an increasing propensity to honor the Lord by being gracious? I trust that we are those who, like Priscilla and Aquila, and like those, were devoted to serving the saints. Number four. Number four, a Christ like leader which is Paul, a Christ-like leader, enduringly loves all of Christ's flock. All of Christ's flock. My love be with you. Really nice people in Corinth. Nope, that's not what Paul said. 
my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. A Christ-like leader enduringly loves all of Christ's flock. So what should be the response then? Here it is. Submit. Submit to godly leaders for the sake of Christ's love and for your greatest joy. Submit to godly leaders for the sake of Christ's love and for your greatest joy. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1.24, Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. It's for your joy. This is a reaffirmation of genuine love from the apostle. Paul is saying, make no mistake, I love you. And he's saying, I want to take it up a notch. I love you all. I love every one of you. You might be thinking after this letter that some of you got singled out. Some of you got called out. Those causing division. Chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those who are diminishing, trying to change around the gospel. Chapter 1. Those who are diminishing Paul's ministry and preaching style. Chapter 2. Those who are living in immorality. Chapter 5. Chapter 6. Those who are taking fellow church members to court instead of forgiving them. Chapter 6. Those who are in dysfunctional marriages. Chapter 7. Those who are unloving toward others with different convictions over meats offered to idols. Chapter 8. 9. 10. Those who are in confusion over proper roles and authority and submission between male and female, especially when it played out in the church. Chapter 11. Those who are abusing the Lord's table, the love feast. Chapter 11. Those who are abusing spirit gifts. Chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, and those who are confused about the resurrection in chapter 15, those who struggle big time with giving sacrificially to the work of the Lord and honoring his servants, chapter 16. And how many of the people in the church at Corinth are like, he's talking to me. I think he wrote to me. And he's saying, I did. Thank you for listening. I love you. You all, I love you. Will you please open your heart and receive this love and then go back and read my letter. You're convinced, you're settled. He loves us and we love the Lord and we need to repent. And now let's do what he has written for us to do. And he closes it all with, Amen. So be it. The end. You say, well, how did it end? Well, he had to write them again. He had to go visit them. They were people with struggles. But the question for us this morning is, how does it begin with us? What will our response be? So this morning, as we consider what is my next step, if I'm going to obey the Lord, if I'm going to have a humble heart like Paul wanted for his Corinthians, how do I respond? What's my next step? How do I demonstrate humility and grace and love? Have you received his love? First of all and foremost, have you received this love? You can't give away what you don't have. It's not yours, but it's freely given. It's in Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Have you received his love? Have you received Christ? Are you in Christ? If you're in Christ, are you growing in love? Are you growing in grace? And as a church, we will respond. We will pray. The praise team will come. And we will sit and we will think about it. And then we will stand as we are moved in this song to say, yes, this response is my heart's cry. Lead me in love to those around me. Use us for your glory. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Father, as we draw this beautiful, precious letter to a close this morning, I pray that you will, by your spirit, take it and apply it to every heart. I thank you for the enduring love of the Apostle Paul for his people. I thank you for the warnings, the challenges, the reaffirmation of love that he gave. And may every person here this morning understand deep in their heart that they are in fact indeed loved with an everlasting love. My love as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor is imperfect. It falls short. It misses the mark so many times. And I don't like that. And I'm not proud of that. But Father, you are the one who judges all hearts, all lives. You know all things. And so I appeal to you, Lord, that you will take your word through a broken servant and you will minister it in grace to broken hearers. And for any who are proud, arrogant, and built up, may you tear those walls down. 
for those who are broken down in sorrow this morning. I pray that your spirit would build them up, bind them up, heal them, restore them. And it's all because of the gospel. It's all because of the cross and the resurrection that we have a reason to sing and we have hope that endures for all eternity. And I will thank you and I will praise you in Jesus' beautiful, powerful, and glorious name. Amen.